So welcome to Travel Geeks. Uh, I'm Sarah Barrell, Senior Editor at National Geographic Traveller, and I'm very happy to celebrate the day that Canada reopens for international travel with a spotlight on one of its wildest regions, the Northern Canadian Territory of Yukon. This evening, our panelists will be offering expert tips on how best to discover the mountains, ice fields, rivers of Canada's last frontier. And we'll be sharing advice on how to plan inspiring travel itineraries and also how to immerse yourself best at home in the region. And to give our newly rekindled Canadian travel spirit a bit more of a boost, there'll be a prize draw to win a Yukon goodie bag, courtesy of our sponsor Travel Yukon. And the link for that will be in the chat room at the end of the session. So I'll remind you again at the end. Um, feel free to share your ideas uh, in the chat. There are some Nat Geo uh, Travel editorial team members there too. If you want to ask a panelist a question, you have to pop that in the Q&A function. Don't put it in the chat. Um, and now to introduce our panel. This evening, we have freelance writer and journalist Adam Weymouth, author of Kings of the Yukon, an epic account of Voyage by Canoe, his Voyage by Canoe, uh, along the Yukon River. So I'm going to wave at Adam. Hey, Adam, give us a wave. Welcome. Uh, then we have uh, Terry Lee Isaac, heritage expert and owner of Chishoni Tours. Hey, Terry. Um, and hello to wildlife photographer Peter Mather, whose incredible images of Yukon are going to be scrolling across your screen this evening. So just remember to look and listen to us as well, but they're pretty amazing. Uh, and finally, Robin Anderson, manager for Travel Yukon in Europe, UK. So welcome to you all. So there are a few places, I think, in the world today that have remained so unchanged over time as the Yukon. It's vast, it's Canada's least populated territory, and it's a place where you'll find more beasts of fur, feather and fin than you will people. So how best to take this wilderness in? So my first question, and I'm probably going to pop this to uh, Robin, I think. Um, what are the classic itineraries to cover the best of the territory? And what sort of time frame should UK travellers or indeed any traveller be setting aside to explore the region? Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, great uh, questions to start. And I mean, it, it is big. The Yukon is about the same size as uh, Germany, Switzerland and Austria combined. Um, so it's a it's a country sized part of Canada. We're, we're pretty fortunate in Canada to have all that open space. Um, the, the traditional uh, way that that Brits travel to the Yukon, uh, it varies and it, it varies depending on the season. Um, the summer uh, travelers will probably uh, travel by rental car or maybe even by caravan and move from town to town or community to community and uh, and explore um, the over 4,000, nearly 5,000 kilometers of roadways, including some of Canada's most epic drives. The Dempster Highway, which is the only highway in Canada to cross the Arctic Circle, the top of the World Highway, which has as the name suggests, is, uh, is our highest road and is just spectacular. Uh, the Alaska Highway, which was built during uh, World War II. Um, these, are, these are road trips um, of a lifetime and, and a lot of Brits will travel to the Yukon in the summer uh, to experience uh, those, uh, um, uh, to experience the Yukon that way. Um, however, we are starting to see increasingly uh, a lot more Brits coming in the winter months. And starting right about now, we're into our, our aurora season, our northern lights viewing time frame. Uh, as soon as the skies get dark, we start seeing uh, northern lights again. We've had some amazing displays already. I imagine Peter's already been out doing some shooting this uh, early fall. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, we, we often see Brits coming up, maybe combined with a skiing holiday in su uh, southern Canada and popping up for three or four nights of aurora viewing at night. And as you see some amazing images there uh, and uh, some incredible uh, daytime winter activities from dog sledding to uh, snowshoeing, uh, ice fishing, uh, cross country skiing and so on. That's pretty much sounds like a lifetime of trips in one one trip. <laughs> so time frame. OK, I'm going to put this one to Terry. What, what do you think people should be setting aside for a trip to the Yukon? A week, two weeks? I mean, obviously, there are limitations. It's quite a long way to come. I mean, can you cover a decent amount in, in say, a two week holiday? I would recommend coming here in the summer. Obviously, it's so beautiful here. Um, usually people start coming around the month of May after all the snow has gone. Um, and then, you know, um, it's September right now and it's beautifully colored with orange and yellow. And like Robin said, the Northern Lights is epic. I mean, last night, it, the whole sky was lit up and it's amazing to see that. Um, yeah, I would, I would recommend the summer season. And what, like a week, two weeks, like it's a big area. Definitely, I would definitely put aside two weeks for mm -hmm. sure. 
Mm -hmm. And and what sort of um, what's what's the access like? I mean, anyone can chime in here. So what's the best route for, say, UK or European travellers to come into the territory? Um, so there's so much international travel that could get you to land you in Vancouver. And then from Vancouver, we always, you know, recommend our best airline and only airline, Air North. And um, that will take you directly to Whitehorse. And then, you know, you could always contact travel agencies that are based out of Whitehorse. There's Yukon Travel. Um, you could look on the uh, Yukon Travel website and check out the great Yukon Summer. There's so much packaging on there that you could combine your holiday with um, and prices are on there. Um, there's so many travel agencies and people doing so many things in the Yukon for you to take part in. And I would recommend checking that out. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Um, Adam, highlights for you. Where, where are the like, if, if a Brit or a European had to make a big journey out there and it, it, I'm telling you it's worth it, like beyond worth it, what are your highlights? What would you do? Oof. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm, question. I'm, I'm, and, and I'm speaking as a Brit as well. So yeah. uh, the Yukon completely blew me away coming from London to the middle of the Yukon. Uh, everything felt like a highlight, really. To me, it was just kind of about immersing myself in it. So I spent I spent a lot of time canoeing there. And to me, that's a fantastic way to really get a sense of being immersed in it uh, with, with a sort of two week space uh paddling from from whitehorse to dawson or something like that is pretty doable but there's that's the kind of classic route but there's there's you know a million other rivers out there as well and to me for kind of for for for, for, for proper immersion for really feeling like you're somewhere totally different stepping out of london one day and arriving in Yukon the next uh, yeah I, I'm, I'm pretty biased but i would say paddling down a river is a is a pretty good way to go doesn't get more canadian than that I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Peter, how about you? As a photographer, I would say Yukon's got some pretty distracting things to put in a lens. Do you have any like super favorite spots? Yeah, I mean, I got too, uh, too many to list. I think uh, I, I paddle all the rivers all the time. So yeah, I love the river paddling. Do a lot of hiking, like the Chilku Trail, uh, the uh, trail that people came for in the gold rush way back in the day. Um, you know, a four day hike from Alaska into the Yukon. I mean, that's uh, something everybody's got to do. And then uh, the kind of cultural uh, tourism too, like uh, going out to some First Nation fish camps or doing a tour like uh, Terry's tours with Northern Shoshone tours or up in Old Crow. Like uh, those are the kind of things I like, the kind of wilderness and the, and the uh, First Nations culture for me that uh, can't top that. So Terry, thank you. Thanks very much, Peter. Terry, looking at uh, the, the key areas to explore for travellers interested in Yukon's First Nations uh, culture, where would you where would you say are, are key points? So there are, so if you look at the Yukon, there's 13 First Nations um, that are settled land claims. And if you travel from Whitehorse to Dawson City, you're travelling through all of those communities. And when you hit the landmark of Dawson City, there's Trunjak Wichin, which is a... Um, the First Nation that's had settled, one of the first First Nations had settled their land claims and they have a beautiful cultural center that um, displays all sorts of cultural arts and crafts and they also have a lot of cultural activities going on. Um, you know, Pelly Crossing also has um, cultural days. Um, and then in Whitehorse, there's a um, festival that's called Adaka Cultural Festival, which displays all sorts of indigenous arts and crafts and cultural uh, experiences that usually starts at the end of June, beginning of July. So I would recommend if you're really interested in that, I would recommend booking your time in that time era. Thanks, yeah. Terry. Yeah, I wouldn't mind chiming in there too. Uh, I, I just think like every single community uh, has something going on. They've got really cool visitor centers. Uh, there's uh, more and more First Nation businesses open up and so um, basically everywhere you go, if you look, uh, you don't have to look too hard to find it. And what are the kind of, some of the experiences that have really resonated with you, Peter, in that respect? What, what kind of activities can you get involved with? You know, like uh, going to fish camps is something that I think is really cool. Um, uh, going up to Old Crow where they're doing like uh, traditional caribou hunts and you can go out in the land with people, that's pretty cool. There's a place called uh, Long Ago People's Place where they show you like how people lived 200 years ago that's in the champagne Asiac territory. Um, and then there's the, uh, we have some really famous uh, First Nation dance, dance groups in, in the Yukon, in Canada, in Carcross. And uh, those are also cool. I mean, 
yeah, everywhere you go, you'll find something, but those jump out at me. And Adam, you, you had some great experiences as part of your journey, I think. Um, what, where, where, did you, um, where did you really engage with um, that culture in that part of Canada? Uh, I spent quite a lot of time in Teslin, which is a little bit further up the Yukon from uh, on, 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 Te on Teslin Lake, um, which has got an amazing visitor centre there as well. Some of the beautiful dugout canoes. I'm sure Terry can tell me uh, what they're what the the what they're, what they're called, but I, I forget the names now. With these huge uh, pieces of single wood, beautifully painted, which are, which is right on the lake there. Mm -hmm. um, really enjoyed it there. Spent a lot of time in Dawson as well. Um, yeah, and and I think I I, so I, I probably came, uh, you know, you know, re reading about the Yukon before I went reading the reading the Jack London, reading the sorts of things that got me excited about the Yukon in the first place. I realised I was so sort of ignorant of, of of the kind of the First Nation side of things before I went, and it, and it really opened up my my thinking about these places in a, in, a, in a very different way. And and the cultural centres, yeah, in Dawson and in Tesdam were, were really important for that. I think for me. I love that everyone's mentioning the cultural centers because they really are the gateway to Indigenous culture. The, the beauty, as, as uh, folks have said already, the beauty of traveling around the Yukon is with, with 14 First Nations um, who, are, who have been resident here for thousands of years, as you travel from point to point uh, in the Yukon, you're literally moving through a different country, a different culture, a different language. And the cultural centers are the place where you can start to access that as you're moving around. I was just in Haines Junction on the weekend and they're working hard uh, building a, a traditional um, a red cedar canoe that will be ready for a big event next summer where they'll be paddling it. It's an ocean going canoe. So they're, they'll haul it to um, uh, Haines, Alaska. And then the plan is to, uh, to paddle it from Haines to Juneau. Um, so it's amazing to be there at the uh, cultural center and, and talking to the carvers and the elders who are guiding the carvers and hearing about how the, the uh, canoe is kind of emerging from this um, amazing piece of wood that's thousands of years old. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful. So that's definitely the, the place to start if you're looking for Indigenous culture and, and wanting to learn um, more about the people of the area you're visiting in, uh, definitely go to the cultural centres. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robin. Um, moving on a little bit, we talked about Dawson um, and there's some amazing gold rush heritage in uh, in Yukon. I mean, it's really almost visceral hair raising history kind of at your fingertips. Where would you say is the best place to experience this kind of history? Because it really is somehow still present. Uh, where, where would you say is, is a great place to kind of get on into grips with the 19th century gold rush atmosphere? Um, I'm going to ask Adam. Um. I, I, the, the most fascinating gold rush experience I had was actually just across the border into Alaska at Eagle, where I went for the 4th of July, where the gold panners of all, all across the United States and Canada meet up for a 4th of July celebration. And, and that, to me, was a real sense of what gold is today. Um, I, I, I did bits and bobs in the UK. I, I forget the name of the tour now. I got taken out on a on, on a gold rush tour. But I, I, I suppose... the what, what I took away from the gold rush was also the First Nations culture behind it. You know, there's this very romanticized 19th century adventurous frontier spirit. There's also a very, very dark side of, of, of the gold rush, which was which was a culture that got completely eradicated at the same time, which which I knew absolutely nothing about before going to Dawson. Mm -hmm. So in, in some ways, again, the cultural center, which gives that kind of flip side to the gold rush, which was which is, you know, which is not a happy tale at all. Um, Peter, you've, I think you've also been been there. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And so, like for me, the gold rush, uh, you know, to get the adventure side of it, um, there's that Chilku Trail, and so yeah. it's a four or five day hike that goes from Skagway into the Yukon, and it's very well preserved. Uh, it's very safe. It's well maintained. It's just a, it's incredible. It goes through all these different eco zones of like coastal rainforest to like these dry, rocky. Canadian shield like uh, tops and then it gets into a really dry rainforest and, and you finish on a on a train ride so that's that's a really good way and then the other way is just really going to Dawson City which was the epicenter and just going around and living learning about everything there I was just in Dawson uh, just on the weekend and uh, I've done most of the gold rush stuff and so while I was there I ended up uh, 
had this big dome, this mountain just outside of Dawson City. And, and so they've created all these uh, bike trails, like the First Nation has built these bike trails. And so you can bike up this mountain and bike down it. And so I was just doing that all weekend. And uh, so if you go to Dawson, it kind of has a mix of everything. It's got the wilderness, the adventure, and uh, the cultural history, the First Nations history, but then also like really neat gold rush stuff. Like if you watch that program, there's a TV show called uh, Gold Rush on Discovery. It's like one of the most popular reality shows in the, in the world. And it's based out of there. And so it's it, you're really surrounded by present day gold mining as well as like, you know, ancient gold mining. It's pretty cool. Yeah, Dawson City is kind of crackling with atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm going to also say that you, you, if you go to Dawson City, you don't do a Parks Canada tour, you, you've missed out. Um, Dawson City is a national historic site, the entire town. Um, and area uh, is actually a national historic site. So it's maintained by Parks Canada and they have some unbelievable programming um, that kind of transports you back in time. They, they're, they're animating um, important um, periods of, of the gold rush history in the buildings where they occurred 125 years ago. This is the 125th year, by the way, since the, um, the 125th anniversary of the discovery of gold in Dawson, uh, 1896, gold was first discovered there. Um, and uh, so there are some uh, buildings that date back to that time that have been restored. And, and uh, uh, when you walk through the doors, it's like stepping back in time. They're also now incorporating a lot more of the indigenous um, area history into those um, presentations that they're doing. So, you know, you're getting, uh, as you said, Adam, um, the, the, uh, the gold rush uh, context, the stuff that was happening was exciting. Still considered the greatest gold rush in the history of the world. 50,000 people showed up in Dawson City in 1898. Um, at the time, it was a much bigger town than Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, which now have millions of people. It was first city in Western Canada to get electricity. Um, some of the uh, most famous families in the world were there, the, the Guggenheims, the uh, Rockefellers, uh, Thomas Edison was there, Jack London was there. It, it really was a, a place in time that was really amazing. Um, however, there were also people who had been living there for thousands of years before the gold rush. And often that piece isn't um, as widely known. So it's great that Parks Canada are starting to bring that indigenous culture and, and indigenous history and their experience, which wasn't necessarily always positive, um, into the discussion. So people are getting a bit more of a sense of that. The other thing I love about Dawson, and Pete, you, you mentioned it, um, Dawson is an active mining area. So, um, you know, there, there are miners um, who are continuing the tradition and uh, there's a lot of gold still uh, in the Dawson area. So, you know, you just go to a bar and, uh, and you know, particularly probably the pit um, or one of the other bars and uh, chances are you're, you know, uh, you're gonna you're gonna be rubbing elbows with real miners, and um, most of them are pretty uh, happy to talk about what they do and and uh, and and how they do what they do. So uh, you know, in the Yukon, it's a super friendly place. So I, I honestly recommend just just chatting with somebody in a bar or in a restaurant and and ask about their life. And next thing you know, you'll probably be out on the claim, and they'll be showing you how they do the mining and uh, uh, inviting you for dinner. So uh, it, yeah, it's a it's a great place to uh, kind of step back in time, but also see how it's done. Uh, in modern day times as well. Does anyone That's, have any burning recommendations for where to drink or what to do? In Dawson? Yeah, I got one, right? It's funny that Robin just tells that story because I was just in Dawson and there's uh, that famous like reality TV show and uh, one, the main character is a guy named Parker Schnabel. And uh, I was just at the Drunken Goat, the, 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 uh, the uh, Greek restaurant in Dawson. That's my favorite place to go. And, uh, you know, he, him and a bunch of the guys from the TV show were having a beer right beside us. Uh, and so just like he says, like you can uh, you can meet you can meet all these miners and get the history and you can also meet famous like reality TV shows if, if you want in, in, the, in Dawson. Um, um, to carry on with um, what Robin was saying about the cultural aspects. This is where Toshone Tours, my company, comes in. Um, so. Fort Selkirk, where um, it's the mouth of the Yukon and Pelly River, this is where I would be taking my tours to visit is uh, remote Fort Selkirk, historic Fort Selkirk. And it was a rest stop along the way, along the Chilkoot Trail to, you know, to Dawson City. And um, a lot of people stopped in there. And it was once a boom in town too. And it was going to be capitalized as the capital of the Yukon Territory at one point. And, you know, I bring in a lot of cultural aspects here because I'm Northern Toshone and I'm from the region and, um, and I'm able to bring a lot of cultural history 
to that to my tours um and i think it's just an eye opener to everybody because they didn't know and and i want them to know that's part of what i do is um is educating people on um who we are and where we come from and before the gold rush era sure and and how how much are communities opening up generally like obviously everything's been pretty locked down like it has here like it has everywhere <clears throat> a place is opening up communities kind of you know to operators opening up communities opening up to welcome again. visitors again um yes so as you know the border is open um to the u.s i'm not sure about international i think international travel is actually opening up as well i just heard um india is allowed to enter canada today um yeah, we are and, as well. yeah and so um Yes, I know. And I'm new this year. So next year, I'm going to be so busy. I know I am. So, you know, if you want to book a tour, book it through to Um, Robin, just a quick one to you. So is, is, is Yukon kind of ready to go? Are things opening back up? How, how is that aspect of, of things? Yeah, I mean, uh, just like everywhere else in the world, we certainly were affected. Um, our uh, our, our government early on um, did take pretty, uh, here in the Yukon, our government took fairly extreme measures um, and we, we mandated a, a, a mandatory 14 day um, self-isolation period for all um, travelers to the Yukon. Um, and so that kept our numbers relatively low. As things started to open up, we did have a flare up in the summer that we're still kind of digging out of. Um, numbers are, are vastly improved now. Um, uh, and, but I think it, you know, it was a, a bit of a warning sign for everybody that we're, you know, we're, we're not out of the woods on this yet. We're, we're among the highest vaccinated regions uh, in the country. Um, we're, uh, over 80% of uh, people 12 and up are now vaccinated. So that brings a lot of comfort, but not, uh, nonetheless, there are still um, communities that are still um, a bit nervous. Um, but um, we've got visitors coming. Uh, our offices here are attached to our visitor center and we're seeing um, uh, increasing uh, numbers of travelers from British Columbia, um, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario coming in and, and a few Americans who are generally transiting on their way through to Alaska. Um, and, you know, look, the Yukon is a we're, we're a tourism place. We, we're, we're natural storytellers and we love to share this incredibly beautiful place with, with visitors. And uh, I, I think um, uh, as, uh, as we've now kind of moved through the pandemic and we're well vaccinated, um, we're still being diligent, but uh, at the same time, I think folks are, are we're, we're travelers ourselves, by the way, um, Yukoners are prolific travelers. Uh, most of us, or a lot of us uh, came here because we were travelers, fell in love and and uh, and never left. Um, so you know we we have that 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 sense of adventure I think in our in our core and and we also love to share this beautiful place that's our home. Uh, and I think uh, UK travelers are going to find that next year uh, when they start coming in again. Uh, now that the borders are open, um, there's going to be a pretty welcome, a friendly welcome when they arrive. Thanks, Robert. And we, we, we're just saying to clear up double vaccinated entry requirement, basically, that's the, that's the thing, isn't it? Yeah, great. Um, one of my personal favourite places was Kluane National Park, um, the ice fields there, the mountains, just almost otherworldly. I've never seen anything like it. It's a must. Um, it's got the largest ice fields below the Arctic, I think that's right. Um, it's really something else. <laughs> uh, how best to experience it? Um, I'm going to put this one to Peter. Uh, well, um, I leave in two days to do a, a hike there. So I'm doing oh, a four day jealous. hike. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Up uh, the Slims Valley. So you like you hike up to where these glaciers are and you're overlooking them. Um, and then uh, there's this other hike called the Donjek Glacier Hike. Um, it's got a couple of names. I, I, I unfortunately I don't remember off the top of my head the First Nations name. Uh, I'll look it up and put it in the uh, in the comments on the side. But it's like a, a, a seven or eight day hike, and it's got to be one of the best hikes in the world. And I had no idea. I lived here my whole life. I had no idea how good it is. And uh, I, I, I went and did it uh, during the COVID year, like last summer, and it was one of the best hikes ever. So if you get a chance, do that. Um, and then the other ways are like if you camp on uh, uh, Kwani Lake, uh, there's grizzly bears that are walking along the shore all the time. That's pretty good. Um, Haynes Junction is the main uh, like kind of epicenter of the community. It's a uh, Champagne, Asiac, and Kwani First Nation community. Um, and uh, so it's got a lot of like cultural history there. 
um, and it's just right on the edge of the park. So that's kind of your starting point if you're going into Haynes Junction. And then, uh, you know, hiking is, is the main way. And then there's some flight seeing too. And then uh, there's a bunch of really good cultural tours, like First Nation tours with uh, some elders like James Allen. He does incredible tours right on the lake. Um, and then uh, there's that long ago people's place that's on the way to Haynes Junction that I talked about where they teach you about how people used to like trap ground squirrels years ago and, and uh, just kind of like those really interesting things about how people survived on the land 200 years ago, you know, uh, it, which is in, just incredible to hear uh, the ingenuity and, and how they did everything. Um, so those are the kind of the, the ways to do it, hike and, and, and fly and, uh, and culture. Yeah, I mean, even for people that aren't <clears throat> sort of super fit hikers or whatever, you can get incredible flight seeing tours, which is what something that was kind of not so well known to, to Brits. Um, they're affordable, more or less, and they give you an amazing view of what looks like, you know, primordial landscape. Um, and, and as you say, Peter, you can't, it just defies imagination that people have lived in such a, you know, really kind of harsh in some ways environment for hundreds of thousands of years. Yeah, it's 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 much. Where else? And, where else? Oh, sorry, go on, go on. And, and like, and, and uh, they have incredible campsites on the lakes there. So if you want to come with the RV and set up on some of the lakes and just do like walking around and day hikes. Yeah. Um, you know, Kalani Lake and Kathleen Lake have got to be two of the best campsites on the planet. So um, those are also good ways to see it. But you definitely, I agree. My my uh, eleven year old nephew was just visiting from Alberta over the weekend, and uh, we were in Kiwani to do a little hiking and, and paddling and fishing. and uh, And I surprised him with a flight sing tour over that glacier that's uh, on the uh, screen right now. Um, my eleven year old nephew, it was beautiful. At the end, he said, "You can't come to the Yukon and not fly over the ice fields. Uh, it's uh, it's a must." So uh, definitely put that on your uh, on your list if you're if you're coming in. The the area is massive. The Kalani itself, it's a World Heritage Site. It, as you said, it's home to the St. Elias Ice Field, which is the largest non-polar ice field in the world. Um, so it it is it is an incredibly vast island or ocean of ice. Um, but you actually don't see the glaciers from the roadside. Um, so you do have to either hike in, as uh, Peter mentioned, um, and if you're int interested in that, there's just absolutely incredible world-class hiking. Um, but if you don't have quite that much time or uh, you're not up for a multi-day backcountry hike, um, within about 10 minutes of takeoff, you're over that glacier that was just in the uh, frame there a few minutes ago. So uh, definitely plan to do that trip. Um, and where else? I mean, that's the headline national park, at least for, for me, uh, but there are there's plenty of other places. Like if people are going to do a bit of a kind of cherry picking of national parks that give you this kind of wow landscape, where, where else would you suggest? That's kind of open to Robin or whoever. Well, uh, Tombstone Territorial Park, um, which is a Yukon park, um, and, and that's just uh, north of Dawson City. I imagine Adam spent some time up there on, on one of his visits. Um, it, it's spectacular scenery um, that uh, uh, really, um, if you're in the Dawson area, if you don't go up to the tombstones to spend a little bit of time and, and do some hiking, uh, you've, you've kind of missed out. So I'd certainly recommend that. Um, I know Peter's been to some amazing places. Uh, he, he's likely been to uh, Ibavik uh, National Park, which is a, a, a fly-in only um, uh, national park up in the upper northwest corner of uh, the Yukon, uh, right uh, bordering on Alaska and, and the Beaufort Sea. Uh, that is a, a, an absolute uh, gem of a park that very few people uh, actually visit. Um, and Adam, where do you think are the best places to explore by boat with with paddle power? Um, I mean, we're not really. Watery. Yeah, well, we're not exactly. Yeah. Uh, and I was uh, so the, the the trip that that we did, we ended up starting at a very so the the, the kind of the classic paddle trip that I, that I mentioned before is White Horse to Dawson, and there's quite a lot of outfitters. That will that will do that as well. So you can rent your canoe in Whitehorse, and then they'll pick it up in Dawson the other end, and you've got a couple of weeks or however long you want to, to paddle that stretch, and that's kind of quite quite comfortable paddling. Uh, 
and and fairly simple. So I, I turned up as kind of complete novice. P P Peter actually took me out for a day, uh, which was kind of the most extreme canoeing I'd ever done. Uh, <laughs> uh, after having done after having done uh, uh, yes, but I, I turned up as a complete novice and, and really sort of just like just 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 felt my way. And then from that, really sort of the sky is the limit. Really, the second the second year I was out there, we ended up catching a float plane from Whitehorse up to a tiny little lake called McNeil Lake uh, up in the Pelly Mountains, and following a bunch of different rivers: the McNeil River, the Nisutlin River, the Teslin River, all the way down, and then coming out on the main stem of the Yukon just below Whitehorse. And that was kind of one itinerary out of out of hundreds that you could be doing. Really, that was that was pretty exciting. That was that was full of rapids and and all sorts. Um, so yeah really the, the the limit is your imagination I, I i think you can kind of find someone that will take you in a float plane and, and start really wherever you want that's you know that's quite a pricey way of doing it but that's kind of one end of it but but the white horse to dawson route will really give you a complete immersion in this kind of in this wilderness beautiful camp spots all along the way uh more or less not seeing another habitation for a couple of weeks a, a real sense of yeah a real sense of something just completely completely different that you're not going to find in the UK and you said you went in as a novice um mm. I mean what like you you'd never been in a canoe like I'm wondering if people would approach I'd that you've never been in a canoe yeah I, I sold this idea for the book of doing a four-month canoe journey and I was sitting in a meeting with my editor and she was like so how much canoeing experience have you got then and I said well you know I've spent about half a day in a canoe up to this point um I was, I was, uh, and, and and I did sort of the training that I could, but it, you, the, the the English rivers are kind of absolute trickles compared to a lot of what what you find in the Yukon. Um, so yeah, I was I was I was more or less a novice. I was I was lucky enough to find an amazing guide called Hector McKenzie who who works out of Whitehorse for for the first part of the journey, um, and he really showed me the ropes a bit. Um, but it's but it's really doable by yourselves as well. You know, I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing it by yourself as as, as a first timer, but going as a pair, uh, wearing life jackets, being sensible, taking the right precautions for bears, and sitting out bad weather, and being sensible basically. And and within that, uh, a two week to new trip from something like Whitehorse to Dawson is is totally possible. Yeah. Do you have any particularly hairy moments or any like wow? You know, this just blew my mind. Moments that really stuck out. Not no spoilers for the book. Obviously, people. Saw it, right? <laughs> we did. <laughs> we had uh, we had a couple of pretty close run-ins with bears. Yeah, which which were absolutely fine. But again, coming from England, where you know our, our, our biggest land carnivore is a badger, it's uh, it's quite different being in the Yukon and uh, yeah, just being at a different place in the in in the pecking order. Situations that were absolutely fine and, and in hindsight just incredibly memorable. Um, you know, in, in the end, just a real privilege to have such sort of close encounters with with such magnificent animals. Um, the, the main risk I found on the Yukon was was just the water, really. It's, it's, it's wide enough that if the wind picks up, it can get quite choppy. Uh, there's one small rapid called Five Finger Rapids, about halfway along, halfway along the, the, the passage from Whitehorse to Dawson. Um, but again, again, really doable. Like I say, yeah, it's, it's, it's common sense, pretty much. Um, I, the, the advice I got told was don't let the fear of bears ruin your trip. I'm sure I'm sure any of the rest of, of, of the panelists that actually live in the Yukon can talk a lot better about bears than I can. Yeah, uh, to me, it was the kind of nagging that... background fear of my mind. But I was, you know, I was told that don't don't let it get in the way of enjoying yourself because the chances of even seeing one, are, you know. Yeah, you've got to be quite lucky in the end. You've got to be quite lucky. Mm. In, um, and, yeah. and of course, people camp. They camp wild. Like, Peter, you've done it. You camp wild. This is just part of the deal, right? Yeah, yeah, and, and like um, I always tell people, I've probably had a thousand, maybe two thousand uh, bear encounters in my life, uh, or bear sightings, and only one of them's been negative. So, um, you know, it's it's important it's important if you come to the Yukon to read about what to do if you have a bear encounter. But again, like one in two thousand um, is a uh, is pretty good numbers. You know, it's it's like uh, probably a lot safer than driving in the, in uh, London. And I also want to um, add that it's very important to know if you're going to rent a canoe from Up North Adventures to really educate yourself before you head out on the Yukon River. Um, there is guided tours, which I would totally recommend. 
I was in Fort Selkirk a few times where um, there was unguided tours and people have run out of food by the time they hit Fort Selkirk because they were not informed what food to bring and all of their food that they brought had already rotted. And, um, and then I found people didn't bring warm clothes. So, you know, here we were um, in Fort Selkirk taking care of the people that really the canoe people should have been taken care of in the first place. So I would recommend a guided tour if you don't know what you're doing. Sure. Totally agree, Terry Lee. And, and as an operator uh, doing tours in the backcountry like you are, you'll be familiar with our Wilderness Licensing Act. Um, so all Yukon tourism businesses that are actively operating tours in the backcountry um, are required to be licensed. Um, and um, as part of the license, there's minimum um, first aid, insurance, um, training, um, reporting, um, and that kind of thing. So um, uh, and we were, in fact, the second jurisdiction in Canada to do that. Um, that act is already nearly 30 years old now. Um, so uh, travelers can feel really comfortable when they do come that they're, if they do book with a Yukon tour operator like Terry Lee, they're going out with somebody who has um, had to meet um, fairly strict requirements in order to be able to host people uh, in the places that they do, um, because it is remote and it is wild and um, uh, things can happen when you're uh, operating remotely um, uh, you know even even somebody with a cut finger can very you know that that can quickly become an emergency situation so um, the the government's making sure that uh, anybody that is hosting travelers is uh, well prepared for just those kinds of incidences um, and what about wild camping in that respect I know you it, it, it's, it's true to say you can do it anywhere right you can just more or less I mean you know not on people's properties but you can you uh, you can pitch up in campsites, bring your tent. But what about, um, are there kind of more set places with little, you know, more like cabins or safari tents? Uh, would anyone like to recommend a great spot like that? Where if people who are not perhaps so used to super wild camping? That's probably one for you to tackle, Robin. I, I know that there's a, a lot of good places. I just don't remember them off the top of my head. <laughs> you just pitch up with your one man tent and a bivy bag and that's it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> It, it depends a little bit where you are. When, when you're in national parks or territorial parks, of course, there's there's usually designated camping areas. Um, so you, you know you, you have to be respectful of that and um, and and make sure that um, that you're camping where you're supposed to be. Um, but yeah, there there is an, an, an enormous amount of of open landscape that uh, that is undeveloped, and is, and so you you would be doing primitive camping. And and yes, uh, effectively you can camp anywhere. Um, uh, Fortunately, there you know there's a lot of um, developed campsites along the roadsides. There's uh, uh, an amazing number of um, uh, of government campgrounds, nearly nearly 50 government campgrounds all over the Yukon. Uh, these are primitive campgrounds with without um, electrical or uh, sewage hookups, but um, uh, perfect for uh, for remote camping. Um, a lot of RV parks uh, that do have uh, full hookups. Um, so I, I would say, generally speaking, when people come, um, when, when they're backcountry hiking, um, they're usually in a park, um, and uh, and so they'll they'll tend to be kind of going towards those places that have designated campsites, um, and uh, and would likely be 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 spending their evenings there. Uh, but you do see people that uh, literally just kind of pull off uh, to the side of the road in a, in a pullout and, uh, and spend the night there as they've they found a nice view over a lake and uh, just decided, you know what, this is where we're going to spend our night and uh, there's no permit or, uh, or a fee and, uh, required for that. Um, and what about best sort of hikes to campgrounds? Like if any, anyone's going to have to say, right, this is like one of the most amazing day hikes you can do that gives you a great view or a, a multiple day camp to camp hikes. Anyone got kind of burning recommendations for must do's? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the stuff I love doing. And so uh, a really good day hike would be in uh, Kiwani National Park. It's called King's Throne. And it takes you from Kathleen Lake to the mountains overlooking um, you know, Kathleen Lake, that's, you know, one of the best hikes of all time. Uh, there's another one called Samuel Glacier, where you hike, it's a nice flat hike, it's a long hike, like 20 kilometers, but it's nice and flat and takes you overlooking a bunch of glaciers uh, outside of uh, Haines Junction, so that's really nice too. Um, but there's a, I mean, uh, there's a website that's called Yukon Hikes, and there is essentially an incredible hike in each community in the Yukon. 
Um, and uh, you never in your life will I ever get to, to, to hike them all. So there's a, there's a lot, you know, and, and that's what most people do with day hikes because people are like coming to visit, they're staying in RVs, they're often staying in, in campgrounds or campsites um and then doing that um another you know what and another trip i wanted to mention was uh and maybe i'll let terry lee talk about this too which mm -hmm. uh if you're going up by pelly where she's based out of there's just like uh or if you're paddling down the yukon river there's this uh old community called fort selkirk and so it's like a fort from like uh 1890s um that's been like basically totally preserved um you know this community on the yukon river so there's no roads or anything to it i think you can canoe down the river or you can probably go with terry lee down to this site and yeah. it's got a lot of uh prehistory from, from before like the gold rush people came and then it's also got a lot of history like uh from the gold rush i don't know terry do you take people yeah down? so i've seen a question about paleontologist sites and archaeological sites that is Fort Selkirk. Fort Selkirk was prior to the, the gold rush, like I said, our First Nations people lived there, you know, thousands of years before um, everyone else came. Um, we call them the Europeans. It's written in books. <laughs> the Europeans came. Um, um, so, um, you know, everything, it's very historically put together. Um, our, you know, we share the site 50-50 with our First Nations government and Yukon government. So the money comes together, we hire the people and they put, make sure that the buildings are all put together and that they're maintained for the visitors that stop by there. Um, you know, the history and the stories, it is a trek through town. So my tour offers about four to five hour tour, depending on how long we stay. We usually end up staying longer. That's why I say five hours now, which I should change on my website because it says four hours. And, you know, it's a trek through town and it's uh, an hour and a half talking about everything. Um, lots of questions and answers throughout the way. Um, you know, if you don't have good shoes, you're definitely going to have sore feet when you come back. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's I, I would totally recommend it not only through my, like, of course, I'm going to advertise my tours, but if you are going to rent a canoe from Whitehorse to Dawson, you do stop at the remote location along the way. Thank you, Terry. That's, that's great. I've got so many questions from uh, our audience scrolling in. Um, so I'm going to move on to that because I'm mindful of the fact that we're going to get kicked out fairly soon. Uh, first one for Peter, any tips for photographing wildlife in the Yukon? What might you see and how can you get the best photos of them? <laughs> yeah, you know, like there's a couple of really good places to photograph. Uh, you know, uh, the Dempster Highway is uh, one of the best places to photograph for wildlife and landscapes. It takes you from, it's like a, a gravel highway that takes you from Dawson up to Inuvik. And you can even go from Inuvik all the way up to the Arctic Ocean and Tuktoyaktuk. You know, you probably want to take at least a week to drive it. Uh, best time to go would be like the last week of August, first week of September, because lots of animals, it's cooler, so they're moving around. Not much bugs at that time of year. Uh, you see northern lights, and then you get these incredible fall colors in the tundra. Uh, so that would be one highlight. And then another highlight is Sheep Mountain in Kiwani Park. Um, and so the sheep there are these white dull sheep they're really unique oh there goes one right now it's kind of showing up at the top like that's that's where and so that's a that's a great place to photograph too those would be my two uh you know highlights and i guess the third one would be if you come in spring and you're driving around the yukon you're going to see some bears along the side of the road you know you don't want to get out of your vehicle to photograph them stay in your vehicle but you can get some really great uh bear photographs too in the, in the spring when they're like eating the grass on the sides of the roads and people, someone else has asked, a few people have asked, um, for those of us who um, aren't used to driving in that kind of part of the world, uh, is it, is, are the roads easy? Is there, a, are there alternative ways to get around if you, if you don't drive, for example, like how, how best to navigate? Like it's, it's great road trip terrain, the Dempster being one I really, yeah. really want to do. Um, can you do it if you don't drive? Yeah, you could do it. I mean, there's a lot of tours that uh, take people around. Uh, you can paddle around. Uh, there's yeah. a lot of people biking around. So there's a lot of different opportunities and you can fly around in between communities too and explore. So there's all that. And then, 
in terms of like how difficult to drive, it's super easy to drive here. It's very safe. The only thing you probably need to know how to do is to change a tire if you're going off the paved roads. Some of the roads aren't paved, especially if you're exploring more and camping like in a, in a tent, doing the Dempster, you're gonna wanna know how to change a tire. But like when you rent a vehicle, they'll show you how to change a tire so that you're covered. Um, another one, um, this is just open to, to whoever. Best time to experience the, experience the Northern Lights and the best way to do it. Now, interestingly, like it's still summer, but you all were saying, I think before we even started chatting about how much you've, you've seen them already this year. So so where, when's best and how best? Um, anyone wants to chime in? Anyone? Yeah, I mean, I guess I, that's probably me because I'm out there doing that a fair bit. Uh, you know, we're lucky right now. So like the Northern Lights, they go in these cycles where uh, like they peak every 11 years and then they, they drop down where there's not a lot of Northern Lights for three or four years. And we're just come out of that. So the last three or four years, there hasn't been a lot of Northern Lights and we're just coming out of that. So there's lots of Northern Lights now and it's going to probably peak in a year or two. Um, and so uh, my favorite time is like right around now, uh, you know, September, October, because it's not too cold. Um, there's no bugs out. There's not a lot of snow, and uh, and it's still bright relatively late. Like the, the sun's still up at like eight thirty, nine o'clock, and so uh, in, but you get to see northern lights later. So right now is the perfect time in in my books. So so fall autumn, would you say? Yeah. Is that kind of. Yeah, like August, September, and uh, October. The the beautiful thing about about northern lights is it. Th the the effect is happening year round the challenge for us is we we have 20 nearly 24 hours of daylight in our summer months so the skies aren't bright enough even or dark enough even in you know may june july for stars to even appear um so it's 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 like midday in in the uk um, it's that sort of light but once we kind of get into that later period in august and from august really through to about april we have these incredible uh, beautifully clear dark uh, starry nights and as soon as it's dark enough to see aurora um uh, you know as soon as it's dark enough it, it allows you to see aurora so um yeah it's not uncommon uh, you know if you're on a canoe trip on the yukon river adam I, i'm not sure if you uh, caught it uh, when you were traveling but um you know on august 10th august 15th um once the stars come out uh, you might start to see some aurora um and then, as, as Peter said, nice long kind of fall season, we sort of call it our summer aurora season. And then uh, around around November, the seasons really change. We get into our deep winter, so it would look a little bit more like the, the photo that's up right now. Um, and that's a beautiful time to come to. And there's there's a, a nice long winter aurora season uh, where you have these incredibly dark, beautiful nights to go out aurora viewing uh, with a tour company. And then during the day, go dog sledding, uh, go snowmobiling, try some ice fishing, try some snowshoeing. Um, so you, you can kind of do a, a bit a mix of winter activity plus Aurora. Um, so for for most of the year, other than those those uh, three or four summer months, we, we can see Aurora um, almost the entire time. That, that that arrangement of activities you just said, someone's asking, is it a great place for families to travel, particularly teens? That all sounds pretty great to me. Do you have lots of families visiting? Um, is it a good family holiday destination? Yeah, I, I think so. I think traditionally we were probably um, not as much of a family destination, uh, but you can sure see that changing. A lot more Canadians are traveling and bringing families there closer, of course, but increasingly, uh, in fact, out of the UK, uh, lots of families. And yeah, once, once the kids get to that point where they're able to be a little bit physically active, I mean, we, we have the most incredible mountain biking uh, in, in North America, amazing paddling, um, you know, all kinds of great adventure sports, um, all the winter stuff. Um, so yeah, for, for families that with active uh, kids, um, this, is, this is an incredible place to do it. So, you, you know, you've got all that amazing history and all that beauty. Um, but but you can get a real buzz with uh, some of the uh, the fun outdoor stuff that uh, uh, that folks are, are able to do here. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think if you've got active kids, it's just a massive, great big playground on a on a epic scale. It can't even you know slack jawed, jaded teenagers are going to be like, wow, you, you, you're going to get that reaction. I think um, one for Terry Lee. Are there opportunities to stay with uh, First Nations cultures, communities, stay in the community directly? Um, yeah, most communities have hotels or motels. Um, 
um, there is um, that place near Haynes Junction along the roadway there called um, Old People's Place or Long Ago People's Place, sorry. And they offer overnight stays. I'm also going to be offering overnight stays in Fort Selkirk next summer um, during the period of uh, the midnight sun. So they'll get to see daylight all night long. Um, and then, um, you know, there's definitely hotels and motels, like I said before. Um, there's a lot of um, other, you know, they're not so much Indigenous um, people hosting, but a lot of people have um, cabins along the, in the Whitehurst area, like Marsh Lake. Um, and, you know, all those experiences, like in on the lake, um, you know, there's sun dog retreats. Um, they're not Indigenous owned, but it's still really nice to just, you know, set up a time to camp with them um, just to see the aurora evening skies if you're coming in the fall time um, I would totally recommend it and, and there's a there's also shack whack tours I think um, on Kwani Lake uh, fish wheel tours um, you can stay with them in Dawson and up an old crow Paul Josie I forget his company name but Josie tours they I think there's there's if you search there's stuff where you get to stay with First Nations people and uh, that's a, that's a really kind of a special experience. So um, if you get a chance to kind of like live, you know, stay with, stay with some First Nation people in a community, then you're, you're seeing the real Yukon, you know? Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's definitely worth it. Some of the most um, amazing uh, memories for me were, were, were eating particular things, obviously always, right? But really particularly, you can say spruce tip tea, Arctic char just caught um, and what people have been asking what are the kind of food highlights what can you expect to eat while you're in the Yukon what's distinctive about the food culture I'm, I'm food guessing food. Terry Lee has an awesome bannock recipe oh yeah bannock bread I <laughs> don't I don't but my friend Teresa she has a company that just came out she sells her bannock recipes um packaging on um um online now and she's called tree saw bannock and uh i don't have her website or anything but um she's just getting big so i'm really glad i'm very happy for her and yes i know how to make bannock <laughs> it's really easy i don't need a recipe you can, you might it's need all in my head yeah <laughs> no and, it's bread. Um, so going bread. back to places to eat there's a lot of like it's so amazing like everyone would be blown away about the restaurants Cake and Whitehorse. There's so much options. There's, you know, Mexican food. There's um, East Indian food. Um, they have something that's called every Thursdays, and it's because of COVID that usually they would open every night, but in the summer season. But it's called, um, and maybe one of you guys could. I don't go there often. I probably went there once. It's uh, a bunch of you know, people selling their products. There's Daddy's Donuts. There's um, uh, maybe Robin. Can you refresh me on what is? It's a market. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, th there the food scene is definitely exploding, and um, uh, there are some amazing markets. Uh, some some um, collaborations between a few uh, food entrepreneurs. Um, uh, wonderful markets in Whitehorse and, and Dawson that run all summer long. This is also the time when um, this is our kind of our traditional harvesting season. It, um, we're we're well into uh, the start of fall now, and that's when the berries get ripe, when the mushrooms are at their peak, uh, when people are fishing, uh, when people are starting to hunt moose. Um, and so you start to see um, this time of year is when people are, are out gathering all of those things and harvesting and bringing them home uh, or bring them to the restaurants um, and then using the cranberries that were harvested in a cranberry scone in a bakery um, or incorporating a mushroom into an amazing uh, mushroom sauce for a steak. Um, so yeah, uh, it's it's really a lot about, our, our food scene is really a lot about um, uh, uh, you know eating those beautiful, locally harvested, organic, wild uh foods that are here in in you know in 
great numbers and um, and we we can still literally uh, just walk out our back doors um, and and you know land in the middle of an amazing berry patch. Um, so uh, you'll 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 you know this is the kind of time of year when you'll start to see those ingredients finding their way into the uh, restaurant menus. Yeah, you know there's a there's some neat places in Whitehorse that I just think about off the top of my head. There's a place called the Oyster Bar. I think it's uh, it's new and it was like voted like one of the top new restaurants in Canada. Um, there's a there's a bar called the Woodcutter's Blanket, and it's like right off one of our main streets in Whitehorse. And you drive past it, and there's like two full size moose, like bull moose, fighting on the roof. And then they have their own craft beer inside. So that's you know that's really good. Uh, my favorite place is like a, a Mexican place called Sanchez Cantina. And then my daughter, she's uh, one of the cooks at uh, Klondike Ribbon Salmon, and that's like one of the stops everybody goes to because it's a uh, it's just like right off one of the busiest streets in Whitehorse and you're kind of eating in a wall tent, like a big wall tent. Um, and everybody's crammed in there, uh, but it just has very good food and a really, really good atmosphere. Like going in there, you get the feeling of what it would have been like kind of passing through during the gold rush where everything's hustling and bustling and you're getting this good food. And, and uh, so those are, uh, those are kind of a couple that jump out in Whitehorse. Yeah, and Dawson, don't forget the drunken goat. <laughs> drunken goat bar restaurant it's actually both a pub and restaurant yeah thank you um for quick one just a quick burst to all of you before we uh we wrap up uh and it's it's that horrible question <laughs> if you had to choose one absolute must place to visit while you're in the yukon where would it be i'm gonna i'm gonna go to adam for this one i think it might be watery well, I'd say I'd, I'd say Dawson. I've I've had some really good times in Dawson. I I, I did paddle in there, but I, I've yeah, I've I've got a lot of good memories. I, I ended up spending a couple of weeks there each time I passed through, and uh, yeah, a lot of the places that people have mentioned, a lot of good times in the pit, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, yeah, half done like uh, uh, yeah, just a, a lot of uh, it's, it's the place that sticks out when I when when, when I think back. Yeah. Dawson, great. Mm -hmm. How about how about you, uh, Terry? Where would you recommend? as a must one must see place so i'm going to be biased because i'm first nations indigenous <laughs> i would say spend your time with you know a first nations indigenous person because you're going to get that authentic um view of the yukon um you know we call ourselves first nations because we were the first peoples here so i would totally recommend collaborating with someone from uh who's first nations from the yukon Great. Um, Peter? Uh, well, Terry stole mine. So my second one is going to be uh, a wilderness campfire. You know, get out in the wilderness, spend a couple nights by a campfire. Yeah, yeah, I'd be with you on that. Um, Robin, I know you're not supposed to say things like that, are you? The whole place. <laughs> Do you have a personal yeah. place that you just, you love going back to time and time again? Yeah, Dempster Highway. Uh, yeah, the, the Dempster was my first experience in the Yukon and, uh, and I've been so fortunate in the time I've lived here. I've, I've driven every highway in Yukon, Alaska, Northwest Territories, Northern BC, but the Dempster still for me is, uh, it grabs my heart every time. Um, it's, it's so special. The, the landscape is, is so unique. There's nothing else like it out there. So, um, that's, uh, that's my happy place. Great. Um, thank you. Thanks to all of you. Um, for spending your time with us this evening. Really appreciate it. Uh, most of you are actually coming from all the way out in the Yukon. Uh, so yeah, whatever time it is now, have a, look, a good lunch, enjoy your lunch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and thanks, yeah, thanks to our sponsor, Travel Yukon. Um, a reminder that the prize draw we have going to win a Yukon goodie bag, uh, which includes a bevy of travel goodies, including a backpack, woolly hat, hydroflask, coffee mask, uh, mug rather, and a copy of Adam's book more importantly. Um, the link for that should be in the chat right now. God, sorry, that's so bright on my face. I've, I almost can't see. Uh, there you go, now I can see. Um, we're also giving away uh, 10 tickets to, there's, the screen should be rolling across, there you go. 10 tickets to uh, attend our food festival on Saturday the 17th of July. Um, and if you're not lucky enough to win them, uh, early bird tickets for that event are available now for just 10 pounds. Um, that's gonna be an incredible event, bringing in foods from across the world, chefs, uh, it's a real fun one. Um, and if you've enjoyed this evening, we've got two more Travel Geeks coming online soon. 
um, offering expert advice on travel to Kenya on the 28th of September and to Estonia on the 12th of October, more bears and wilderness, hooray. Um, and a reminder that it is almost your last chance to enter our annual travel writing competition. So you need to send us 500 words of your sparkling travelogue by the latest Sunday, the 19th of September <clears throat> to be in with a chance to win a trip of a lifetime to Kenya, courtesy of Kearney and the chance obviously to be published in our magazine. Um, we've got some great pieces of writing. So, you know, do, do, do join in. Uh, subscription offer, uh, three issues of NGT for five pounds with the code NGT5. There's our lovely current issue with the Deep South on the cover. Um, please subscribe. Uh, and that's it. Thanks again. While you're filing out of the auditorium, as it were, we're going to be playing you a little uh, National Geographic video you might enjoy. And thanks again to our panellists. And we hope to see you here again soon. This is not a border or a frame. It doesn't bind us or limit us. It is a portal, an entrance to the whole world and a means to make it better. Every place, story, and passion lies through here. And for more than 130 years, this is where we explorers and innovators have gone. And going, it has been part of our mission to give back, reinvesting part of our profits into the future explorers and their passions. This portal is the threshold of the next chapter of humanity, where we don't just see the world, we change it. Come with us, and together, We'll go further.